Beside me is an A520 motherboard, specifically the ASUS A520M-K provided by AWDIT, which there will be a link to them in the description down below if you want to check it out. Now, you'd be forgiven for not having heard of A520 before. It's AMD's lowest end chipset and is mostly ignored by the enthusiast community, but for good reason. Just look at this thing. It's as barren as a desert. You only have two RAM DIMM slots. You have a lonely uh, AM4 socket in the middle, a single X16 uh, PCIe slot, a single M.2, and a chipset heatsink that is uh, not too much bigger than my thumb. Yeah, let's take a look at this thing. But first, a message from this video's sponsor, Azrock. Their B550 Tai Chi Razer Edition board supports Razer Chroma RGB lighting, both on the board and via standard and addressable headers. It also features support for AMD's Ryzen 5000 series CPUs, has an optimized and powerful VRM design for even the highest end 5950X, and killer E3100 2.5GB LAN and AX1650 Wi-Fi 6 on board. Find out more at the link in the description below. The A520 chipset is the most basic one that AMD offers. In their product stack order, it goes A520, B550, then X570, although you've likely only heard of the top two. That's because those are the ones that are generally meant to be used by enthusiasts like us, with the A520 chipset mostly being resigned to OEM systems who are building with especially Ryzen APUs, and they don't really need all that much extra fancy features, they just want the most basic and cheapest thing they can throw in, hence why this board in general only costs £60. The main difference between A520 boards and say B550 is that these boards don't support direct overclocking. They do let you set the base clock frequency and any memory speeds you like, including the sub timings, take notes in cell, but overall it's a bit more restricted. You have a lot less IO capabilities, and for context, AMD CPUs, especially Ryzen, are effectively system on chips or SOCs. What that means is that the CPU itself has pretty much all of the controllers on board to basically directly connect anything it wants to the CPU. You don't need a, a north bridge or a south bridge like old motherboards used to have, so the memory controller is built onto the CPU, PCIe controllers for graphics and storage built onto the CPU, and even a USB controller is built onto the CPU as well, so you can directly connect USB devices to your chip. So the chipset mostly acts kind of in the same way that a USB hub would but for PCIe. It lets you connect up some extra USBs, uh, some extra PCIe devices, and even some SATA ports as well, but other than that, it's pretty basic. It doesn't need to do all that much, just let you connect a few extra things and act like a hub that can then send that back up to the CPU via its uh, PCIe Gen 3 X4 link. The board in general does not support PCIe Gen 4, despite supporting both Ryzen 3000 and 5000 series CPUs. Also, the top X16 slot does not support bifurcation, or at least the, uh, the PCIe lanes that go directly to the CPU don't support bifurcation, so no multi-GPU support. Shame, I know. But overall, it's a pretty standard board. You can use it pretty normally in most gaming systems. You have some SATA boards down the bottom, you have an M.2 slot that you can use uh, like normal and uh, is directly connected to the CPU via PCIe Gen 3. So, no big deal. And actually, interestingly, in the BIOS, while you can't set a direct overclock, like you can't change the multiplier like you can on a B550 or X570 board, you can still enable Precision Boost Overdrive, which is kind of interesting. You go into the BIOS and set it up just like normal, which is interesting to see, although I won't be testing that in this video for one very obvious reason that well, like, I will explain in a second. To give you a hint, it's uh, that, the VRMs. Those are the main point of contention for a board like this, especially if you're using one of the higher end chips like I am because apparently I'm insane, uh, and a Ryzen 5900X. Now, the setup that it has here, at least from what I can tell, I'm no expert in VRM designs, uh, maybe refer to Bill Zoid on that one, uh, this looks to be a four phase or four plus two phase setup. 
What I do know though is that the MOSFETs, that the drivers, the, the switches that turn on and off to help decrease the voltage from 12 volts from your power supply down to the 1.3 to 1.45 that your CPU needs, those aren't great. Technically they are rated for 60 amps, although if you look at their data sheets, you can see that as the temperature rises, the performance of their current carrying capacity drops pretty significantly. In theory, the VRM should be able to provide anywhere between double and quadruple the amount of power that the Ryzen 1500X I'll be testing with actually requires, but in practice, I'm not so sure. So testing a 1500X on a 60 pound motherboard. Something just doesn't feel right about this. And for good reason. Now the tests that I was running weren't just to see how quickly this thing would catch fire, but instead my full suite of CPU benchmarks to see just how much performance you lose by using a relatively low-end motherboard with a relatively high-end chip, at least on the, the Ryzen side of things. To that end, the A520 board offered around 2% less performance in a Cinebench R20 single-threaded. That was actually quite surprising because the single threaded workloads generally don't require all that much power being drawn through the CPU and so it comes down to more boost algorithms and patterns uh, that matter most there and generally you have enough thermal and power headroom that that works just fine and is fairly level across boards but in this case not quite. More interestingly though, the multi-threaded run only lost 1.8% performance compared to the 2.2 in single, although that kind of makes sense when you realize that Cinebench R20 multi-threaded only takes around 30 seconds to render on all cores. Now that's not overly long, as when we use a longer test like a rendering in Blender with the BMW scene, which normally takes around 2 minutes, 2 minutes 15 with a B550 board on this 1500X, well, on the A520 board, it takes 11 seconds longer, or around 8% slower. That's a pretty big deal, as you're losing, uh, or you're leaving a, a pretty big or large chunk of performance on the table with your rather cheap motherboard. But what happens when it's a really long render, though? Well, using the gooseberry scene, it's not pretty. That normally takes around 9 minutes to render on a uh, 1500X on a B550 board, but on this A520, it took 12 minutes, or 30% slower, or in other words, you may as well have bought a 5800X and a B550 board, because that's how much performance you're losing there. Interestingly, when I let the VRMs cool down and ran the test again, it actually only took 10 and a half minutes instead. That goes to show you just how much of a performance gap you can have with cool VRMs versus hot ones on this board. And that's kind of a, a big performance gap. Clearly they can provide enough power to give reasonable performance from the chip, but you probably shouldn't try. And if you're interested, here are the Adobe CC Suite apps using Puget Bench. I'll include them here so that you can see they're all in the same graph, but there's not a massive gap between any of them, just a, a slight performance dip kind of as we've come to expect. So what about gaming? Well, in Watch Dogs Legion, at 1080p ultra settings with the same GPU and RAM speed, we're getting four FPS average less. It's not much, but I generally don't see much of an FPS loss from this game, so to see four FPS gone is kind of surprising. In Cyberpunk, again at ultra settings, it's six FPS average less. That's still not enough for you to really notice in games, but the 1% low is dropping six FPS too, well, that's one you might feel well playing. And of course, knowing that you're losing 6% of your performance might make you reconsider your buying choices. And finally, in Fortnite, it's pretty minimal, only three FPS lost here, so really nothing massive, nothing to shout about for sure. The reason why there isn't a massive FPS loss in games like there can be in CPU heavy workloads is that gaming doesn't really tend to stress or at least draw a whole lot of power through these large core count chips. It generally loads a couple of cores at a time, but nothing too strenuous, and so the VRMs can generally keep up and keep the chip at mostly the same sort of speeds that you would get on a more proficient board. It was able to keep the temperatures of the VRMs at a relatively reasonable point, at least for this setup, which, what temperature you ask? Well, it was 80 degrees Celsius while gaming. 
Yeah, that's hotter than most B550 boards that I've used get while doing 100% CPU loads, so that's not fantastic. But do you want to hear what the maximum temperature I recorded these VRMs hitting while rendering in Blender? You might want to sit down for this one, because it was 120 degrees Celsius. Cooked egg, anyone? You would be right to assume that this is a bit of a fire hazard and generally sort of dangerous in general. Uh, although I should make it clear that the data sheet for the drivers say that it is a uh, maximum or a thermal junction, a maximum temperature of 150 degrees Celsius. So there is a bit of thermal headroom there. And uh, Hardware Info reported that the motherboard did cut power to the CPU to prevent overheating from the VRMs. It, it knew to cut power around that sort of temperature and, and it did. It went from 120 down to around 110 and sort of stabilized there. That was in the Gooseberry render where, uh, like I said, you got significantly less performance, but when I let them cool down fully and then it had time to run that render, it was able to not thermal throttle quite as heavily. Technically, you could assist these by adding the sort of stick-on heat sinks that you get for, say, a Raspberry Pi, although I would be uh, cautious of that, uh, as I wouldn't want to have uh, the heat sinks effectively just uh, block heat transfer out and sort of soak it in and burn them out, or having those heat sinks fall off and short the back of your graphics card. Actually, in fact, probably don't do that. In fact, generally don't buy an A520 board for a Ryzen 9. If you're buying it for a 3600 or something like that, one of the lower end Ryzen chips, this will be decent enough and you won't lose much if any performance. But if you're spending 600 pounds on a CPU, maybe don't spend literally a 10th of it on the board that powers it. Spend a little bit more, get a decent B550 board and enjoy some extra performance. So there you have a look at an A520 board, a bit of a, a torture test with a, a Ryzen 9. I, like I said, don't recommend it, but if you happen to have an A520 board, especially one on one of the lower red Ryzen chips, I think you will be fine. You're just missing a couple of extra features. Otherwise, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Would you pick up an A520 board for one of your sort of cheaper systems, maybe building a, a, a non-gaming system for friends and family? Would you buy one of these instead and save a bit of money? Or would you prefer going with a, a more reliable B550 board instead? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. Also, if you want to check out the 3600 and A520 bundle that AWDIT sent over, I'll leave a link to them in the description down below. That's not an affiliate link, uh, you can just check it out. There will also be affiliate links to A520 boards in the description you can check out, so feel free to take a look at those. And there will pl be plenty of other links in the description you can check out as well for merch or hoodies or t-shirts like this one or a load of other cool designs uh, that I designed myself. Uh, there's also a Patreon for access to our Moneyman Discord chat and sponsor free videos and of course you support me directly too and a load of other stuff, feel free to check it out. I'll leave some more videos on the end cards. Uh, I'm going to be doing a B560 board uh, or test fairly shortly so make sure, make sure you're subscribed for that one with the bell notification on so you don't miss it. That's pretty much it. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you all in the next video.